Great to have Hi. I just heard you were talking about when it's really difficult to co-parent in the holidays. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So um, I, I actually co-parent most of the time really well, and we are on the same page. But I, I have noticed, like, the places where we've grown apart a little bit or we have disagreed, and, and it takes a lot more negotiation and a lot more peace and calm within yourself to be able to communicate those boundaries because the, you do share that, that common, at least in my situation, we are 50-50, we share that common raising of those, those children, and we both take a lot of, of care and responsibility with them. So we also are very stubborn and independent people in an, our own right. And so it's like, how do you negotiate those boundaries with people? Yeah. Yeah. So um, my background's actually, it's a little interesting. I always speak in the sense that I say I've had many lives. Um, because I didn't, I'm, I'm 40 this year. I'm very proud to be 40. I was like, woohoo, I made it and I feel great. I'm actually living like a life of desire and living in a place, um, from my, on my own terms and the way that I've designed it for the first time, I think ever. And, um, it came as a kind of a long path. I originally started as, um, well, not this career, but, you know, I grew up in a, uh, what I think on the outside, a lot of people look at as being a very traditional family. We were very functional in appearance, but as most of us know, most, uh, like those kinds of families can be extremely dysfunctional underneath the surface. And so I learned like how to do things to keep my head down. I learned how to like be the overachiever. I learned how to get along in the world and get good grades and be, you know, be the star kid. And it's interesting as hard as you try to be that person, even those qualities get you kind of in situations where you end up not living the life from what you want to live, but you live for somebody else. And then in that sense, you also create a lot of disconnect. I was just talking to my sister about how because I was trying so hard to be good that her and I like have a really hard relationship and we're just now healing that relationship because of the perception. So anyway, I, you know, I went to college. I um, got a, what I thought was a great job and didn't stay. I was just traveling abroad as a foreign business advisor and I came back and got training in sales. I worked with Nordstrom opening different concepts. I've worked with a company called Massage Heights as their director of training and sales and learning and development. Um, you know, I used to work in business consulting and all of this to say that that's what I thought I should do, not what I really was meant to do in the world. And also to say that what it did teach me was that those, um, all of those careers really were using what my purpose and what my superstar power was, but I wasn't using it for like making other people's lives better. I was using it to make some big corporations life, make them more money. So when I got my divorce three years ago, I think in January, it'd actually be three years. So that's pretty in insane to me that it's mm -hmm. come so far. Um, I was, you know, had no income. I'd been a stay at home mom, which was another weird thing. I was like, I need to stay home with my kids. I should do that. And really, I just wanted to spend more time of, with them. Um, and I thought that was the only way to do that. And that a good mom stays home with their kids, right? Like, you know, we have all these like judgments about ourselves. And, and the funny thing is, is my mom didn't stay home with me. She wasn't able to. So I don't know where I get these crazy ideas in my head. But I had that and I, I had really bad postpartum depression as well. So I didn't go back to work. So when we did get a divorce, um, I hadn't worked in two and a half, three years. So I couldn't find the job that I wanted. And I was really blessed to have a coach at the time that specialized in desire. And a lot of people I think look at desire as like, they think of sexual desire. And no, it's just desires that thing that's inside of you that like just wants to come out and it wants to serve and it wants to like be the guiding light. 
And when we can listen to those little voices in our heads, like I truly believe that it, it leads you in the right path. You know, it's mm -hmm. the path of least resistance. So we have to learn how to think, you know, hear the desire. So I was very blessed to have a coach that was a desire coach. And she helped me find those places where I was living from the should. Um, I was living from the trying to look good and trying to be good instead of just trying to be me. And so I spent, you know, a year finding me again. And then I wanted to do the same thing for other people. So I got my coaching certification through that company. And when I realized as I was putting my business together and all the things that I did, I was like, oh my gosh, I already have like sales training and business consulting and I've made millions of dollars for other people and I can do this for people that want to live from desire. I love helping entrepreneurs. I love helping other moms, other parents. It's funny at most of my clients right now are men, but it kind of goes fluctuates here and there, but it's all based on also relationships. How do we, how are we in relationship with another person? How are we in relationship with ourself and how can we use that to live our purpose in the world. And so that's kind of my background, you know? <laughs> um, and that's what I'm doing right now. And I, I absolutely love it because I get to be that stay at home mom and I'm a professional and I get to show my little boys what it looks like to be, to make my own path, to do what mm -hmm. I really love to do, to do something that I'm really passionate about. And I get to spend time with them all the time. Sorry, I get like all teared up because I'm so excited. Like they're just amazing, so. And I look at as a self and so second child, three year old, two months old, able to be there and to be able to experience a big or being able to be a warrior will do that well. And if I'm hearing a static, I can hear a little something, but just let us know if you're. You know, try to figure back and forth a little bit, but I mean, I can still understand what you're saying. But yeah, the what you're saying about you, you get to be with them, but you're still helping other people. And I remember when you and I were talking originally, I was telling you the story about how um, I was doing a Facebook Live on personal development, and I've got my like seven year old vomiting in a bowl underneath me, you know, and I'm like, yay, we're talking about how you just make shit happen. <laughs> And, and my kids get that, like they're, they know that and they're, they're good with that. But, um, like literally he was sitting at my feet throwing up and I was like, but I get to be with him. I can do that. And I can do this other thing. And I used to think I had to choose, but now it's just how, not an if. <laughs> yeah. One of the great and as well is having a, so we, and when I find that it's helpful, and I think that that we think that we can our own, but we can't. If someone, and I'm sure you, it's it's stagnant yourself trying. Well, because you're in your own stuff, like you're in it. And you can get so deep into it. You can get so deep into your victim and like, why me? That you can't actually see the solutions. Mm -hmm. And sometimes um, it, it even just helps to have somebody that can observe and challenge you to be the creator of your own solutions. And that's why I, I love having that. I'm so blessed to actually have a community now of people that will, will help that. You know, I get coaching and I do personal development on a regular basis because I want to continue to grow. And I can't see my own stuff. When I'm in the middle of it, I can't always see it. Um, even, like, fighting with my ex-husband or with my mom. Like, sometimes I have to, like, um, you know, call a friend, you know, phone a friend, phone a coach and be like, hey, this is happening. And I can see that I'm in the middle of it because I've got a lot of sensation and I'm really upset. Um, but it also took me a lot of practice to be able mm -hmm. to get to that place. And I had a coach while I was practicing to be able to get to the place where I could say, oh, I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm triggered. I'm upset. There's something deeper here that's happening for me that may not be what's actually happening or what's going on right now. And a lot of times that's the case. It's not the thing that's happening right then and there. It's a past event that is triggering your emotions in that moment. And, um, you know, my latest 
course that I took and getting certified in is actually NLP, it's neuro linguistic programming. And so that is a thing where it actually helps you clean up or get over those fears or get over those past events so that you can think more presently in the moment. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's also when we were talking about on the introduction of like, how do you parent like now, you know, versus how were you, uh, you know, taught to parent or how did they parent then and, and why it's so important to parent in the moment now, because mm -hmm. Our, everything's changed you know I, when I say parenting your own path it's not necessarily to say that like my mom did it wrong that's not what I'm saying at all she did the best that she could with the tools that she had and it was a very different world that, that I apologize for that so I thought it was on like do not disturb and apparently it's not so there was a little bit of a delay there I was getting a phone call um <laughs> That's but anyway, um, yeah, like technology like that, like, but she would never be even be having a conversation like this. So she doesn't, she parents the best that she can. And even now, like some of those things aren't relative. Like she, you know, she tries to parent my children and I'm like, well, I parent from a much more peaceful place. I parent from a place of, you know, we, we try really hard to not have any corporal punishment or any threats or any, pun you know, parenting from fear. We try to parent from, um, from conversation and love and, you know, choices. And so that's a very different dynamic than what she was raised with and then like what she used. So um, I'll, I'll just say that that was kind of like this roundabout thing about like, you know, our parents weren't wrong. They did the best they could. Now there are some parents out there that were really crappy and I get that. Um, so I'm not discounting any of that, but I think that, that no matter how you were, you were raised, my feeling is, is that pretty much everyone does it differently and they get a lot of flack for trying to do it differently. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they're coming from their best place and that's right. not always, that's the best they can do at the time. That's, that's, you know, and I think that even the ones that are the crappiest, I think they're still coming from their best place. I really think that they don't know any better. And I mean, yeah. I've spoken to so many people who share their story and they start sharing your story and you're like, Oh my God, how could you? know better like you've dealt with some awful awful things so right. you don't have to be angry at ourselves for not being perfect parents i mean i joke around i just said this something to my husband today we were saying something and uh i was like well how much have we saved for um therapy for our children and we were <laughs> exactly. <joking around. laughs> how much have we saved for therapy? because you can come from the best place and give them the best training and everything else and there's gonna be something and that's just a normal parenting thing. You can be the best parent in the world, but there'll be something that's taken in a different way that doesn't, you might not mean it that way or well, you're in a place in your life. And so all of those things do come into play. So then when you have the really people that have not dealt with their own shit and now they're trying to parent, well, then you're coming from even more dysfunction and it's more difficult. So, right. you know, so it's, it's going to be different for everybody. And I, I, I really do think that people are most of the time, you know, accepted to the role, but most of the time trying. You know, they, they, they do what they can with the tools that they have at the time. Right, right, yeah. So so I, I think our sound is better now because I was trying to figure out, yeah, yay. <laughs> the phone call actually seems to have kicked the sound to make it right again, so that's perfect. All right, so that makes me feel better. So what are some of the things that you would like to share? I know you've got some great insight boundaries. I know <laughs> I was so excited to hear you talk about boundaries because I know in my group and I'm sure with – with your people and, you know, boundaries are so huge where people will say, oh, I set a boundary and nobody listened to it. And then <laughs> blah, blah. And I'm like, well, then you're not doing it right because <laughs> that's something you need to work on. So I think very often people think that they are setting healthy boundaries, but they're not at all. So I would love, love, love some of your insight to share with our viewers about, you know, boundaries. What, what are there? You know, whatever you want to come from with boundaries, because it really, we could go on for days about boundaries, I'm sure. Yeah, there's an author that wrote an entire series on boundaries, which is actually the first. So I had no idea that boundaries were even really a thing. And I was actually thinking about this today as we were talking and I was getting ready for the live. I was like, wow, like. I didn't have boundaries. Now I had barriers and I had like 
there, I think I had what most people would consider, you know, a hard boundaries, like, you know, don't touch me there, or I'm not going to do that, or I don't want to do that. But they weren't necessarily healthy boundaries. They were like, covert agreements of, you know, what I was taught, or, you know, what, you know, what the contract said for life, you know, those were the kind of boundaries that I had, I had no idea even how to say no. Like I would say, I'd say yes so many times and then I'd get really upset or I'd be resentful or I'd be angry. And it was because I didn't have healthy boundaries. And so um, I was thinking about that and, and how I learned what boundaries were. And sometimes you have to learn what your boundaries are by actually living it because you don't know what you don't know. So you start off with a certain amount of boundaries. And I will say that the person with the least amount of rules wins. So if you can start off with a few healthy boundaries that you know for sure are they're, they're you know, they feel good for you, then you are in a, you know, you're going to fare better. Both people can win. When you set a lot, a ton of rules and a ton of boundaries, it doesn't really open up and like allow for a lot of connection. And so that's challenging. But mm -hmm. I like to also talk about how boundaries are different than barriers. So this is how I describe it is that a barrier is something that has a negative impact on others and on your ability to connect with others. And they are not necessarily built from love. Most of the time they're built from fear. Mm -hmm. And a boundary is something that is permeable. It's changing. It can expand. It can contract. Um, and it's generally made for, uh, in a way to create a safe environment in which you can then connect with another person in a healthy way. So when I talk about boundaries, like a boundary may be like, um, you know, hey, Stephanie, I don't want you to um, talk over me. So uh, can you wait until uh, I'm done talking? And, you know, and that's mm -hmm. how we, we create this, this, this boundary where it's like, I don't like it when you talk over me. Now, that's not to say that if you do talk over me, I'm going to be like, ah, I'm getting mad at you. Um, but it, it's like, it's a boundary. Whereas a barrier would be like, don't talk while I'm talking. And you can even hear in that tone where a barrier generally is something also where you, you, you're coming from a place of trigger. And that's another interesting thing about boundaries is that you can't actually violate my boundary. You are not able to violate my boundary. I can let you violate my boundary. Mm -hmm. And generally, if you're feeling wrong or you're feeling upset, it's because you've allowed someone to violate your boundary or you've overstepped your own boundary and then you're angry. And what's really funny is you get angry at the other person and not at yourself because you did it to yourself. And I think that's a, a place where we often get stuck is that when we're setting a healthy boundary with someone, we, we don't come from a place of love. We come from a place of trying to control. We come from fear. And those are, those really are barriers because they don't create more connection. So when we're talking about, boundaries with our family what's interesting is that um a lot of times uh there, there's a lot of sensation there's a lot of emotion there's a lot of past and so we have a hard time creating a healthy boundary with people so we just push them out and we create that that barrier in, instead and really a boundary is something that you can like communicate and negotiate with so maybe it's that you know you you want a certain amount of communication. So with the boy's dad and I, one of our boundaries is that we have, um, we, we choose that if one of us is busy or has to work, the other person gets first right of refusal to the kids, you know, so that's, and so the boundary is that nobody else can watch the kids until the other person has been contacted. And then once that's happened, you know, then, then we allow like, you know, family or whatever, it, but it, that's a, a boundary. Now, it would be a barrier if I got upset, like every single time, like that didn't happen and I wasn't contacted. It would be a barrier to him and I communicating. It'd be a barrier to, you know, connection, even the children's ability to spend time with other people. Whereas, um, you know, if this, I trust him, I trust his judgment. And if, if something happens where I'm not able to like do, um, you know, get on the phone or whatever, and, and he goes ahead and, and the children go with a friend or a family member because they can't get a hold of me. Well, that's fine. There's no boundary that's violated there. That's part of like the connection. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 And so
sounds like it's it really has a, lo a lot to do with mutual respect. Mm -hmm. It does. And I think um, it starts with you. Like, mm -hmm. I think that's the other place where a lot of people have a hard time is that, um, especially around the holidays, well, he didn't call me back, or they didn't do this, or, you know, they don't respect me. Well, you mm -hmm. have to kind of look at yourself, you know, like, do you respect you? Did you treat yourself with love and respect when you set that boundary? And are you treating the other person with love and respect when you're making your requests? And I like to, you know, we talked about that earlier on the live today is like making a request versus a demand or versus complaining. So when mm -hmm. we can request something to someone and we put it in a positive manner, um, then it's much more likely to be received by the other person. And that's what I think happens. I think a lot of times people come from such a place of anger and frustration because like you were saying before, and, and I know so I've done this before in my life, so I, I can't even point this at anybody else, but you get to, you're like, okay, okay, okay. Ah, why are they? And then you blow up instead of when you're, it's first happening, letting the person know that you're uncomfortable or that, you know, setting the boundary a little bit earlier. I think way too often we either number, the biggest one I think is we assume the other person can read our minds. Right. They know they like, like, Oh, that they know that they just were rude or disrespectful, or they know that I had something planned or, you know, there's, there's a lot of that that comes around. And, um, I think that's interesting or, or the fact of, you know, I, I say yes all the time and finally it's their turn to do it and blah. And there's all of that that goes along with it too. And you're like, but you never told them no you kept saying yes, you can't be mad if you keep saying yes and they keep taking and then you feel drained. Whose fault is that? Right, well, we go into covert, like I said, we go into a covert agreement with another person. When I say covert agreement, I mean, um, I think that there is an agreement there. And because it's not explicit, it's not an overt agreement where we actually said like, do you agree to this? Do you not agree to mm -hmm. this? Um, then we're holding the other person accountable for holding a boundary or an agreement that they never even had the opportunity to agree to. And so yeah. sometimes when we can just like make that agreement and I noticed that I, I actually, um, if my boyfriend's watching right now, <laughs> uh, we recently went through a thing where I actually had to do a deeper look onto me of like, why am I getting so mad about this? Why am I so hurt? And it was around time. So my stepdad was a, a surgeon and time was a very big factor in our lives. And he was the kind of, he was also really um, a little, almost emotionally abusive around the, uh, the being on time. Like the, and so it, it was drilled into me that like, you were a good kid if you were on time and you were a bad kid if you weren't. And you were a good person if you were on time and you're a bad person if you weren't. And so to the point of like, you even got, I remember going to the movie theaters with them and we would get there like 30 minutes early sitting in a dark theater, you know, and now I'm like, Oh shoot. You know, we, we didn't miss the pre Hey, by the way, I, just, I made a new discovery the other day, which is that you cannot go see a theater if you're 15 minutes past the time that it starts. <laughs> they are not allowed to sell you tickets. I didn't know that because I was not on time, but <laughs> in growing up, we were there 30 minutes early. It was really, really important to be there 30 minutes early. So I started bringing a book, you know, I would sit there and I would read in the movie theater because I was bored. So growing up, this thing about you have to be on time. You're a bad person if you're not on time. And I would get anxious and it was like, it would trigger codependency, triggers an anxiety, it would trigger fear, it would trigger like this idea that I was gonna be rejected if I wasn't on time. So fast forward to present day, and as a mom, you know that you're on kid time. Yeah. So when you're on kid time, if you want to be on time for the rest of the world, you've got to start like an hour early. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, so when you say I'm leaving the house at 930, that really means that, you, you know, I, I have to do this like whole calculation in my head of what is it going to take to get out the door in order mm -hmm. to get out of the house on time, mm -hmm. to get to the rest of the world on time. And um, my boyfriend doesn't get that because he's not like he hasn't been a parent. So I've been having to like explain to him and actually slow down enough to communicate my boundaries around that because I was getting really mad and angry. I was like, how dare you call me when it's like five minutes before we're supposed to leave? I'm trying to pack lunches and blah, blah, blah. You know, and that was a covert agreement. He had no idea what was going on there. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I started to build a lot of resentment. 
because I was like, he's never on time. And when I say nine o'clock, I mean nine o'clock, not 904, not 906. Like, I mean nine o'clock. Or actually, I mean 858. But anyway, you know, so, so I had to actually explain that. Like, I had to, it means 858, or it means, you know, I'm walking out the door and please don't call me 10 minutes beforehand because I'm trying to get everything together. But it was even deeper than that. I was associate, and this is where I say, like, we have to sometimes look deeper, or we have to, like, talk to friends or have, like, people communicate with us so that they can give us a good reflection of what's happening inside, but it was because I was actually putting importance. If you're not on time for an event, then I, I make it mean to myself that I'm not important, and then I get upset because you don't think I'm important. Well, that's not their, your job to think I'm important. It's actually my job to think I'm important. So I had to even back up slow even further and then set the boundary of like, okay, so I want to be there. This is the positive part. I want to be there at this time. And in order to do that, I need to leave at this time. And it's important to me to leave on time um, because I want to honor my agreements and I want, that's how I show other people that I feel that they're important. So it's important to me. So if you're not able to be here on time, um, that's fine. We'll just go separate. And I'm going to leave. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh my gosh, I feel so much better because I'm just going to leave if he's not here. But we have an yeah. agreement. And so he's not angry if I just leave because he understands that it's important to me to be on time. So. And I love, I love that because I think that, it, you know, relationships really bring out <laughs> All these deep things that you have that are, are ingrained in you that, again, you just kind of feel like that's just how it is, you know, and it's, it's your life because that's the way you've always lived it. So for you, as for me, that's how it's normal. Isn't that normal? Isn't that how people behave? So we just assume people will do that. And, you know, my husband and I will joke about how I have never met anyone that I could, I could think something and he will know what I'm thinking. But the bad thing about that is that it will get us sometimes into a trap. Well, the other one will assume the other one would, had read the other one's mind and we hadn't that time. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's almost like a, a double-edged sword because as much as that's great, that can also cause problems because literally no one can read anyone's mind. You can know someone really well and you can think you know and you can be an empath and feel the feelings and all that. But, but there's just sometimes where it's off. So the, the minute that you just assume that the person knows what you're talking about and, you know, and I'll be the one to make plans and do things. And every once in a while, I forget to share the plan, you know, or, you know, and same kind of thing. And then it's like, oh, that was, you no, know, that was my mistake. And to be able to admit your mistake and see where it's coming from. And, you know, for me, a trigger would be, I, and I, this actually happened not that long ago. I made a plan. I have forgotten to tell him. And then later on, I was like, I am so sorry. I did not mean to do that. And then I, I did the same thing as you did. I went backwards and I was like, what was that? Well, in my previous relationship, the request that I was going to ask for was going to cause an argument. Mm -hmm. So I went into automatic mode and was like, oh, maybe if, and it was, was just completely subconscious. I went into automatic mode. and was like, I'm just going to not say anything and then just do it. <laughs> and, yeah. Right. And Oh, I don't have to do that anymore. Like I can just talk it out and, and whatever. And I said to him, I'm like, that was totally me. And this is where it came from. And he was like, all right, it's cool. Don't worry about it. Not a big deal. But that's, what's kind of so cool about a relationship that you're in a healthy, respectful place because you can make those mistakes, learn about yourself, share it and really dig deep within yourself. You know, it's not about learning about, you know, you're learning about the other person, obviously, but it's about learning, taking, like you said before, taking that mirror and learning about yourself and being like, what am I doing in this situation that's making it worse? How can I make it better? And it really is such an inside job. Right. And I think also when, um, you know, the other side of that too is that when we are in relationship with someone, we have this very um, amazing opportunity to get a reflection of ourselves. So mm -hmm. um, relationships are a great place to grow. <laughs> whether it's your relationship with your mom or relationship with your sister relationship with your, your spouse, wherever that is like relationships are a great place to actually grow because anytime someone's poking at you or doing something that you're like, Oh, that's making me mad. Um, it look at where you're doing it to yourself. Mm -hmm. Look at how you're showing up and how they're reflecting back to you that particular thing. And, um, 
And I think that's really hard to do because we like to really point our fingers and like put a lot of blame on people. It's like, where can we actually see that we're creating the situation? So, you know, if you're, and another one, like I was, it was kind of talking to a friend and we were talking about arguments and how you can get into an argument. And then it turns into just like, well, you did this and you did that. And like, and how that can, it's not really serving anything because you're both upset and you're triggered in that space. But like, how are you creating that opportunity? So yeah, you can have a disagreement. You can say like, that's, that's my boundary or that's some, something I like, but can you stop arguing? Can you just yeah. stop and like take a time out? And that's why I like to say, you know, with, even with my kids, sometimes I tell them like, mom needs a time out, you know, cause I can, I, it's totally irrational to be arguing with a five-year-old. And, and especially cause he's really good at arguing. I've taught him very well how to make a case, you know, and <laughs> And his dad's the same way. Like, we're very stubborn people. And it's completely irrational to be arguing with a five-year-old, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so where I can see, like, I'll start to argue with him. And then I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to walk away. Mom is going to go take a time out. And I remember, um, I love it that they're also little reflections of ourselves, too. And, and I say this because I think that there was some parents that were going to be watching tonight. But um, And I, I run a mindful parenting group. And we often talk about, like, parenting and like how to do it from mindful place. But remember last year, it was very overwhelming during the holidays. I had a lot of people over. We're all trying to make food. Um, and my oldest one was overwhelmed and he was getting emotional. And I think he, he can feel me. Like he could tell that I was getting emotional. He's like, mom, I think we need to go meditate. And I was like, nice. wow, that is so cool. I'm so proud. Of but he was, so we went into the bedroom and we turned on the music. I said, do you want music for your meditation? Because he didn't want to take a nap. Like, he was fighting the nap. Even though he was exhausted, he was fighting mm -hmm. the nap. So, But he, was, he would agree to meditate. So we put on the meditation music. And I really thought he was going to fall asleep. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, he's going to fall asleep. But no, he just needed that time to, like, calm down so that he could come back to the present, come back to the overt agreements that were there, and make the requests that he needed in order to, like, be present. And great job, mom, on being able to have him vocalize that instead of getting frustrated and overwhelmed. Right. And, it, and that's a practice, too. So thank you. Like, yeah, that's definitely a practice of, like, going back and reminding them of the tools. So, you know, we have to remind ourselves, too, but we have to remind them of their tools and what they're using in, in school. Like, he's struggling a lot with his anger. And so, mm -hmm. you know, how can we meditate instead of scream and yell and, and lash out at people? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So do you have, if anybody who's watching, this would be a great opportunity to jump in and ask any questions. If you are watching, um, yes, Janice, this is live right now. So if you have any questions, now is the time to ask them. Um, and I know that there's a little, a little bit of a lag. So is there anything that you would like to share before we start answering questions or, or wrapping up, depending on where, where everybody's at and watching? And again, if you are watching this as a recording, you can still ask questions. We will go back and answer them later. So don't feel like you missed out if you missed out on this live. Um, so definitely feel free to ask those questions. But is there anything else you wanted to share? Um, well, I will say that if you are interested in working with me or even talking about that or like getting a, like a, uh, blitz session or whatever, uh, you can go over to my website and it's Desiree, D E S E E R E cruise, C R U Z dot com. And they have a scheduling thing there. And so I, and also on my Facebook pages, I love for you to, to share there, but I think, um, and we talked about this a little initially when you and I were, were talking about even doing this live, which is that, um, I think, when we're setting boundaries and we're trying to parent differently um, and that sometimes we have to remember to love ourselves first mm -hmm. and that loving ourselves isn't a bad thing. When you put yourself first, when you put your oxygen mask on first, like you then have what you need to be able to help others, to help your children and to, to lead by example. And I just want to like encourage people that, um, you know, there was a time when I, I had to set a boundary around the, the type of energy, like, like what was around me. And I remember, you know, my mom, she's an amazing woman. And sometimes she gets, you know, anxious and worried in her own world. And when she would come up, she was worried for me. 
about like, what are you going to do? Like, you're a single mom now and you're trying to go back to school and you're in debt and like, how are you going to pay your, pay your bills? And why don't you just go back and get your nine to five? And I was like, that's not my path. That's not what I was meant to do anymore. And I had to like, I, I couldn't take on that negative energy. Like it was, it was hard enough for me to stay positive for myself, let alone to like fight off the like, you know, no, no, no. What is that? The wonder woman? Yeah, you know? exactly. And so, um, and I said, mom, I love you. And if you can't support me, then I'm going to need you to, to leave. I'm going to need you to like go, you know, away for a little while. But right now I've got to do this. I've got to stay positive. I have to stay strong for myself and for my kids. And so I can't have that in my space. Mm -hmm. And so I said that knowing that like, it might hurt her feelings, knowing yeah. that she could be angry, knowing that she was going to be angry. And you know what? It's okay because I know she loves me and she's going to come back. And sure enough, she did. She came back and she's like, she didn't really say sorry or anything like that, but she, she completely changed her attitude because that was a boundary that I set that I needed to have in order for me to take care of myself. And I just want to encourage people to like, be able to do that for yourself, you know, be able to say, um, I love you. And like, this is my boundary. And if they love you, then they'll, they'll work with you there. Exactly. And the ones who don't, the ones that get angry and fight you and threaten and all that, those are the ones to get rid of anyway. Right. Because, <laughs> you know, there's people are not always going to like your boundaries, but that doesn't mean you're wrong. It means that they are understanding that they might be intrusive in your space. And some of those people are going to say, okay, I get it. And other people are going to turn around and be like, no, I don't like this. And then they're gone. And, and sometimes it's not gone forever. Sometimes it's gone for a period of time while you both kind of regroup. Right. And that's not wrong either. And I think sometimes we try to control that. Like, oh no, they're angry. Now I need to go back and, and take them back and fix this and whatever. But sometimes really that just means letting go and letting them figure it out and come back when they're ready to come back. Well, and I think that my mom wasn't even aware that she was doing it too. Mm -hmm. So, cause she is one of my biggest cheerleaders and she's been, you know, a big advocate for me. And I did a Facebook live a couple weeks ago on um, how, how much she's always supported me in my education and really made a lot of sacrifices in her life in order to allow for the education that I had and that my sister had. And so I, it's not that she really wanted to be negative. Like she was coming from a place of love and concern. Um, so she is a, a great cheerleader, but I think that she wasn't even aware that it was happening too. And so sometimes that's that thing where I think you even kind of alluded to it is like, people don't know what they don't know. They don't know your boundary. They don't know if they're the way that they're showing up in your, your space is actually affecting you in a way, unless you can actually say like, this is what's happening for me. Mm -hmm. And like, again, I don't want to say like make somebody else wrong or blame them, but you can talk about your own feelings and like, what do you want instead? What is a request behind every complaint? There is a desire and there's a request to be made rather than just mm -hmm. complaining. Mm -hmm. so. We want to feel heard. We want to feel understood. And we're, everyone's coming from their own programming. Right. So, you know, it, we are coming from different places. As much as we have a lot of similar wants and needs, there's a lot of things that are very different, which is, again, which makes us so cool. <laughs> you know, as human beings, it makes it so cool and so interesting um, to be able to come from these different places because that's how we connect and that's how we learn and we grow from these different experiences. So it doesn't look like there was any other questions. There uh uh, Janice was asking before it was, if it was live. Yes. If you have any questions, Janice, now's the opportunity. Um, but I, I love it. And I think, you know, just to, to, you know, say this again, we said this in the beginning, everyone who's successful has had a coach and, you know, we've had coaches, um, Tony Robbins had a coach, like, you know, anyone you can think of has had a coach to bring them to the next level. I have, I have some good friends of mine that are coaches that are just amazing, wonderful coaches. They've had coaches. And so, you know, if you think that someone's done it on their own, you're not seeing the whole picture. So to have someone who's been down that road, who's done the work and can help bring you to the next level is so important in moving forward. So find that, that team, that tribe, find that mentor, that coach that can help move you forward, get you out of that stuck place and help you create your best life because that's, you know, Desiree, I love the, the name of what your coaching is. Can you just tell us again, the name of your, of your business? Oh, um, 
Well, my, my, my business well, you're is desire coaching. Desire coaching, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. So it's desire coaching. And I also like to say like lifestyling. So like live yeah. your life from desire, live your life by design. Like you get to make your own, your own path. So yeah, I was like, oh, it's my name, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, and all of that together. So, you know, it just, it's so important to just re reconnect to that and realize that, you know, you're, you're not, there's nothing wrong with you that you can't figure it out on your own because we didn't get here by figuring out on our own that we had our team, we had our tribe and that's how we were able to move forward. So I know that for anyone watching, it is possible for you to learn how to create those boundaries, to learn how to be able to really explain what you, your wants and needs are to even some of the more difficult people in your life. It's just about really sticking up for yourself and coming from a place of love and, and you know, open communication and standing your ground. Well, so those are some big, yeah, I was gonna say like what I, I recently talked to on my, one of my posts about um, crazy wisdom and crazy wisdom is this thing that's actually been present in the Native American culture for a long time. They would actually think these people were insane and crazy. And I can't remember the exact name for it right now, but um, it's this, the people that would speak the truth and it's the truth is not always compassionate and kind, but the truth is there for your wake up and it's to actually serve you. And so one of the things about working with a coach or even, but even like if you have a really good close friend, can they actually serve you is the question. And I think one of the things that um, coaches are really good at is being able to see the crate, like see what's happening and tell you the truth without going on your ride, without mm -hmm. polluting and making it worse and like just you know, making the spiral go down, like they're able to see something from a different perspective that maybe your closest friends and family can't see because all you do is call and like, that's the, you know, the, the complaint or whatever, or maybe they haven't been through what you've been through. And I would say that um, crazy wisdom is based on like, Hey, I've been through these things. I've had practice. I've learned how to get out of it. I've learned like how to create my boundaries or I've learned how to get out of a toxic relationship um, or create a, a successful business. And because I have that crazy wisdom, um, you know, it may not always be kind or compassionate, but it'll be the truth. And, mm -hmm. and the truth sets you free. <laughs> yeah. So, so true. And some of your biggest lessons can come from some of your most difficult experiences. Right. <laughs> right. So those are there too. Well, um, Janice said she's going to have to set a lot of boundaries in her house. I hear you, especially around the holidays. Um, it does not have to be super stressful in the holidays. We, we kind of, it's become that way, but we don't actually have to allow that to keep going. Um, but yes, yeah, start setting those boundaries, start practicing Janice, because the only way you're going to get better at it is by practicing. Well, and I'd say like, too, like, oh, I got to set a lot of boundaries in my house. And that's great. But I would actually look at like, what are your... Um, what do you want? So the best way to actually, it's, it's the desire thing. Best way to mm -hmm. start with what your boundaries are is what do you want to create? Mm -hmm. What, what are the things like, do you want to create a happy, peaceful environment? Do you want to create a place of inclusion? Do you want to create um, a place where everybody goes and does something different? You know, what, what do you want to create? You know, and mm -hmm. one of my things is I want to create a really relaxed environment where everybody's having fun. So I encourage everyone to wear pajamas. I don't say, which is kind of the, the real reason is I don't want to get dressed on Christmas Eve and get all dressed up for some people and have to stress about looking good mm -hmm. <laughs> on Christmas Eve because I have enough stuff to do. No, I like, I want to create a comfortable environment. So I want people to wear their PJs. I want them to have a good time. You know, I want them to show up by six o'clock so that we can all eat on time. And the kids aren't cranky, you know, but it's just, what do you want to create and start from there? Um, you know, the second thing I always ask my clients is what do you feel like is blocking you? And the last one is, um, what would it be like if you had what you, what you desired? You know, what would you envision? And if you can just start there, those are like the three magical questions that get you a lot of places. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you much for that great information and again what we'll we'll put in the comments um your social media links and stuff like that so people can follow you and ask you questions and be a part of your tribe and, and get to join in for that 
So thank you for coming in and watching. And again, those of you watching on the replay, we will be going back and answering questions. So Janice, thank you for coming in and, and staying on for the uh, second half. And uh, we will see you again. We will be having another Facebook Live. I was thinking today, I was trying to remember when Christmas was. I'm like, that's coming up pretty soon. Um, so I'll have to figure Tuesday. out. Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, so a week from today is Christmas. So for those of you who are not ready yet, time to start getting ready. Um, or just decide what it is you're going to do to make it more laid back and not stress out about it. So whatever, whatever that is for you, create the environment that you want, just like you said. I love it. So I will see all of you soon and um, enjoy. Have a great week. Bye. Bye.